Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for being here. Um, well, this morning or this afternoon, it's 12, so I don't know how it depends on what you want. But um, so this title is, um, this talk is about textile based interactions in JavaScript. So this talk is not really about what you should do or what you will do. But it's more about what you can do. Um, a lot of the times uh, when we're at conferences, we talk about the future of interfaces like uh, with React or web components or the new web APIs or things like that. But this talk is more about the other side of the interface, the actual thing that you can use to interact with it. Um, so I already got introduced, but my name is Charlie Gerard. I'm a front-end developer. I live in Sydney in Australia. And uh, outside, the, the, what I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with what I do for work. Uh, but outside of that, I'm also part of the Google Dev Expert program and Mozilla Tech Speakers. I know that there's a few around uh, at this event. So if you have any question about how to get into these programs or what they are, feel free to come talk to me afterwards. Um, uh, yes. So what we're going to talk about today is not about me, but it's about textile interfaces. So what does it actually mean? Just a quick definition. It's using textile as an input to interact with interfaces and or devices. So the main inspiration for this talk is actually something that I came across about uh, three or four years ago that's called uh, Project Jacquard. So for those of you who don't know what this is, this is a collaboration between uh, Google and uh, Levi's, so the brand of uh, jeans, to create a connected jacket. So instead of just spending some time explaining it to you, I'm just going to play the... I'm just going to play the video. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, why? I, why don't... So, there is no video. Great. So, there was a video five minutes ago, and now there's no video anymore. So, I'm just going to talk about what the video uh, shows. So, uh, Google partnered with Levi's to um, embed a jacket with electronics so that you could interact with your uh, phone while you're riding a bike. So, if your phone rings and you're supposed to, you don't want to um, take the call, you could just uh, touch the fabric and it would, it would send a signal to your phone and you would have, you'd be able to interact with a few different uh, interfaces with that. You could switch the music or get the next direction from Google Map just by interacting with the jacket. Um, and after I saw things like that, I was like, to me, it was brand new at the time, like three, four years ago, I didn't really know how to make this. And uh, I got a bit, like, I got really interested into understanding. And this talk is about how you can actually build something similar uh, while just being a JavaScript dev. So why am I actually talking about this? There's a few reasons. So the first one is the evolution of interactions. Uh, we still, most of the time, interact with technology using our laptop or our uh, mobile phone, but there's more. Like we can see some people start using voice interaction, people have tried VR or AR, and I do believe that there is some potential in textile interactions as well. And as technologists, I think it's our role to, we don't have to build these things, but at least keep in touch with what's going on. Another reason is that it's a lot of uh, exciting possibilities. Uh, hopefully, you'll feel the same way at the end of that talk as well. But I know that in technology, well, in our job, we uh, build things that people will use for money and things like that. But to me, technology has a lot more uh, exciting uh, opportunities. And that's why I love this industry. And um, I'll show you a little bit what you can do with textile. And then finally, and that's a personal challenge, is to uh, demystify what you can come across uh, online when you look at innova uh, yeah, innovations. So every time that I come across something that I don't really quite understand, I don't want to just uh, look at it and not figure out how to build it myself. I don't want to think that you have to have a PhD to build certain things or you have to be backed up by Google or Facebook. Uh, I believe that everything that we see, we might not understand at first. There is a kind of cheap, hacky version that we can do uh, at home without having to think that you have to work for Google for, to do stuff like that. Uh, so now well, let's talk quickly about the potential of textile. So first of all, it's flexible. When we think about our laptop or our phone, it's quite rigid. Uh, if you try to bend it, well, it's going to break. But with textile, when you embed electronics in it, you actually can, uh, well, it's quite flexible. So you, won't, you, you have less chances of breaking it uh, easily. Uh, it's very lightweight. Most of the time, we don't even realize that we're wearing clothes. By the way, textile doesn't have to be uh, clothes. It could be there's textile on the table here. You have curtains at home or towels or blankets or pillows or whatever. Um, it's In the end, we don't really look at it that way. We kind of just take it as, well, it's textile. It just covers our body. But there's actually a lot of potential there uh, as well. And it, for it being lightweight, it means that we would 
maybe be able to kind of walk around without having to carry a heavy phone or a heavy uh, laptop. I started speaking at conferences last year, and even if I try to travel light, at the end, my luggage is, or my backpack, is actually quite heavy because of the laptop and the phone and stuff like that. So being able to embed that kind of interactions into textile means that we could actually travel even a lot lighter. Uh, it is quite modular. Uh, so if you want to build your own things, you can add different components. You could add lights or flex sensors or all that stuff, and you get to build it yourself. So you, really, you get to decide where you want it to be. If, even if it was on a t-shirt, it could be the shoulders or the back or whatever. So um, you don't have to actually buy something as it is, like the phone, you don't, I mean, well, Google, I think, was working on a modular phone, but in general, when you buy um, a piece of tech, it's kind of like, you know, you just buy it and that's the way it is and you don't get to decide what parts you want. But by building your own uh, textile interfaces, you get to decide the interaction and the sensors that you want to embed in it. Uh, it's responsive to adaptive touch. So this is in this talk. I kind of had to made up, make up some words because uh, so adaptive touch is a word that I made up because I didn't really know how to explain what I wanted to say. So um, adaptive touch. What I mean by that is that so um, when you, for example, for the uh, jacket by Google, you you interact with it and it sends a signal. But adaptive touch means that you don't have to press it very hard to then send a signal. You could even just lightly touch it and you could have different interaction based on how you decide to touch the jacket. Um, so this is what I mean by adaptive touch. Uh, it is very low power. Uh, if you've been playing a bit with Arduino or Raspberry Pi, depending on the amount of components that you have in your circuit, uh, it's not something that you'll have to recharge every day like you do with your phone. And then finally, uh, it's pretty cheap, so I'll cover that a bit later as well. But if you compare the price of uh, a MacBook to something that you can do, uh, well, obviously, you'll do a lot less with interactive textile that you do with your laptop. Uh, but it's uh, to get started in that space, you don't have um, to spend a lot of money. Okay, so how does it actually work? At the core of it is conductive thread. So this is normal thread that, it mixed, that is mixed with uh, stainless steel. So it means that it carries the current through a circuit the same way that wires do. So um, again, at, well, I don't know if you've been playing with Arduino, but, Arduino, but usually you uh, connect your microcontroller and your sensors with wires in between, and you can do exactly the same with conductive thread. The main difference, though, is that usually wires are coated, like they're uh, wrapped into some kind of plastic so you don't really interact with them, whereas the conductive thread, it's bare. And as your body conducts electricity as well, it means that when you use conductive thread in your circuit, you can know the uh, kind of like electric charge that goes in the circuit, and as soon as you interact with it, so as soon as you touch the thread, you have a change in this electric charge in the circuit that you can track and then use that as, um, as an input for your uh, interfaces and devices. So this is like the latest version of the one uh, of the thing that I built. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of how it works and the modules that you have to use uh, to do that. So I built it three different times. That's just the latest, the last one. You don't have to build it that way if you're interested. There's a few different microcontrollers that you can use or things like that. But at the core of it is the Flora board. The reason I use that one is because it's good for wearables. If you look at all the holes around the board, they're big enough to have um, to be able to put a needle through them. So at first I didn't know and I worked with another board that wasn't made for wearables and I realized a bit too late that I couldn't even put the thread through the holes, so they were totally useless. Um, so if you want to do wearables, I think the Flora is a good one. Then I added a Bluetooth module because I didn't want to have to be tethered to my computer. Obviously, I want to be able to uh, walk around and be in the street or whatever and communicate to my phone or my laptop via Bluetooth. Then you have uh, high uh, level uh, resistors. I'm not going to really go too much into that, but to be able to filter through and get data from uh, the amount of touch, the capacitive uh, sensing, you have to use resistors. Then I have two pieces of threads and finally a battery to make it totally portable. Um, okay. It's forty-eight dollars. <laughs> so uh, when so if you want to buy all these components um, online, it would only be about forty-eight dollars. So when I was preparing this talk, I realized that Google actually partnered with another brand called Saint Laurent to make a backpack. So now they they also have an interactive backpack. But the thing that I looked at it after, and I was like, six hundred and eighty-five pounds. Are you for real? And now I'm like, no, I'm letting you do that for eight forty-eight dollars. So it means that instead of uh, instead of having to buy something that is super expensive, you could actually start playing with that technology and put like interactive stuff in your uh, backpacks or accessories or whatever for a lot uh, cheaper. 
Okay, so in terms of code, uh, now we assembled the, uh, the whole Arduino hardware together. So it can't, you can't do everything in JavaScript, so that's a bit of Arduino, but I'm going to go through it um, line by line, I mean, right, block by block. So it is a, that's pretty much all the code that you need to upload to the Arduino. What's going on here is that we instantiate the Bluetooth communication, we uh, use, there is a capacitive sensor library for Arduino, so you don't have to write it yourself. You just create uh, two capacitive sensors for the two pieces of threads that are used. And we use a threshold. So as I said, in, um, in a circuit, there is always an electric charge, but you want to be able to track when you're touching it. So you put a certain threshold so that when it's over, this one is a thousand, but you could decide uh, whatever you want, really, based on the interaction that you want. But as soon as the value coming back from the Arduino will be over a thousand, it means I'm touching a piece of thread, so do something in the browser. The main, uh, the setup function that runs once when you upload your code to the Arduino, you just kind of reset the value of a capacitive sensor, you set the Bluetooth mode to uh, data that, you know, it, it's with the library so that you don't, yeah, it's, it's fine. And then the loop function is going to run uh, continuously, and what you do, you just read the value from the two pieces of thread, and then as soon as they're above a threshold, you send that via Bluetooth. So in just a few lines of code, you have the capacitive sensing running on the Arduino, and now what we have to do is deal with it in the front end. So as I said, I'm using Bluetooth, so I decided to be able to connect to the browser using Web Bluetooth. So what we're going to do here is we have the name of our, um, of our device that's called the Adafruit uh, Blue Fruit LE. Uh, you can reset that name if you don't want to call it that way, but that will be on the Arduino side. You, um, so for Web Bluetooth, it works, or the Bluetooth protocol, uh, works with services and characteristics. So they have certain new ideas uh, that you have to use to be able to connect to it. And for Web Bluetooth, you, for security reasons, you have to start the connection to a device with a user input. So you can't just run your browser and it will connect straight away. So let's say on the web page we have a button, and as soon as we click, we're going to request nearby devices, and we add a few options to filter down the device that we want to connect to. So that would be our uh, Adafruit uh, module and uh, the services that we want. And then finally, we connect to it, we get the primary service, we get the characteristic, and at that time here, we we'll start to get uh, the data from the Arduino. So we call the start notification um, uh, method on, on the characteristic to start getting the data every time it changes from the Arduino. So every time that the data that, yeah, that the data from my touch is changing, I actually have an event listener and I get that and I have to decode it. So at that moment here, we're just getting a certain value in the browser and then we decide to do with it. At the moment, it will just be uh, an integer and this is where we get to decide the type of interaction that we want to have. So let's talk about the interactions. If we consider again that I have a piece of fabric and I have two conductive threads on it, we could create an interaction of swiping down. I know if I get the value of thread one and thread two in that order, obviously I'm swiping down. And then you could have reverse, you could have swiping up. So if I touch the bottom thread first and the top one later, it means I'm going up. Then you could have a tap or a touch uh, times two because we have two different threads. So if I'm only touching the first one, maybe do something. If I'm only touching the second one, do something else. Then you could have a double tap. So if over time I touched, if for example, in uh, half a second, I get value from the bottom uh, thread twice, it means I'm doing a double tap and things like that. And finally, we could have uh, pressing the both threads at once. So with only two pieces of conductive thread, we could already have seven possible interactions uh, of ways of things that we could do in the browser or with a device. So uh, I'm going to try and show you a bit how it works. So not all the demos are going to be uh, live because I, didn't, I couldn't really bring everything. But so the first thing that I built was just um, I tried to augment my couch with conductive threads. So I wanted to be able to uh, switch songs on Spotify uh, by just touching the thread. So I don't know, it looks like videos are not... Okay, so I don't really know. Okay, so, well, I'll send the slides later. You can watch it later. So what was supposed to happen here is that um, I, when I'm touching threads one by one, I would switch the song to like the previous one or the next one. And if I'm touching them, uh, if I'm touching a piece of thread long enough, the volume goes up or goes down. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in watching, uh, it's like a 10 second video anyway, but um, you can do that later. I have no idea whether videos don't work, but anyway. So the second one I'm going to dive a bit more into is this example um, that was so when Google was working on Project Jacquard, they also uh, showcased that at a conference so people could try the fabric and uh, have that visualization. 
And at the time, I only knew that I was only thinking about simple interactions. So like, oh, if I touch one piece of thread, do something, or the other one. But this one I was quite interested because I was thinking, how do they get the location of where I'm touching and things like that? So I built a very, uh, <laughs> very shitty version. I mean, like, it's not as good, right? But, um, but it kind of works. So I'm going to try to demo it live, and then I'll explain a little bit how it works because I feel like in terms of reverse engineering, that was very interesting to work on. So now is the time where hopefully I tested it like many times. So can we? Yes, OK. So I'm just going to run my server. So for this particular. Um, for this particular example, I'm not doing Bluetooth because I've had a lot of issues with Bluetooth at conferences. So uh, this one is tethered to the computer. That's my first uh, prototype. So if I touch, yay! Okay. So uh, if I so well, it's reverse for you the where I'm touching. But basically, if I'm touching on the bottom left, I should do yeah, bottom left. Um, and if I go to the top right, yeah. Well, that was a bit of a bug here. But um, and if I go in the middle. Uh, you can actually, well, that's just a visualization. It doesn't really do anything. But it means that it's just a piece of thread. Like, I could just, like, flick it around. Well, there's wires everywhere, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, it's very, like, I can fold it. Like, I, it was in a really tiny bag in my luggage. And, um, well, I... <laughs> I only did a visualization because I wanted to reproduce what Google did, but you could really do uh, anything with it. Uh, you could turn it into a MIDI controller for Live.js. Uh, but yeah, I know. I've been trying to join Live.js for a while, but they don't think I'm cool enough. So maybe if I make them a textile MIDI controller, maybe that will work. Um, but yeah, so now let's go just a little bit quickly into uh, how, uh, how made it happen. So instead of just... Um, sewing threads just like horizontally, uh, just like separately, I turn them into a matrix, so a grid. And one thing that is really important is that the threads should not touch. So when a piece of thread goes over the, fa the fabric, the one that is uh, on the y-axis should actually go under. The reason for that is because if you're touching one piece of thread and that piece of thread touches another piece of, piece of thread, then your reading is going to be wrong. Um, so I, do it, I did it in terms of a matrix because all of a sudden your threads can be changed into coordinates. Uh, obviously, you want to be mapping where you're touching the thread to a location on the screen. So your vertical threads could be x0, x1, x2, and then y0, y1, y2. For this particular example, I only used uh, six pieces of threads, but you could see that it was because I did it manually and that already took me a while. So if I had a sewing machine, I could actually do uh, a lot bigger and better stuff. But what is going on after that is that when you're touching, for example, the top left corner, uh, you get data. So you could be like, OK, I get a value from uh, my first thread, my first vertical thread. I get a value from my first uh, horizontal thread. So it could be that the, co the coordinate is then x0 and y0. And then with coordinates, you could, you could add that to Canvas in the browser and stuff like that. So, uh, for example, as I showed here, as I'm touching the middle thread and the uh, bottom thread, like vertically, horizontally, uh, I apply that to then my visualization in uh, the browser. Um, yes, and then you could actually also have, that's the second made up term, temporal gestures. It sounded smart. I, was, I don't really know how to call it, so, but if it sounds smart, I'm, I'll take it. Um, so here, when I showed you the demo, I was just touching one at a time, and it was uh, impacting the visualization. But you could, also, you could um, program swipes. Uh, like I said before. And the way you would do that is you would uh, track data that you get over time. For example, over half a second or over a second, you would push everything into an array. And then every second or every half a second, you would check, OK, if the first value in my array was uh, x0, y2, and then the last would be x2, y2, then it means I'm swapping right. And uh, you know the opposite for swapping left. And you could do up and down and things like that. Uh, so then you could uh, create a lot of different gestures that would mean different things. So even with only uh, six pieces of threads, you could actually have quite a lot of different ways to interact with an interface. Uh, and OK, this is not me, but I wish it was me. Uh, and that, that uses the same principle. So, but it's, a lot, it's not done by hand. You can see that it uses a machine. And uh, the reading is really, really good. So it, it is a great a grid as well. And the, where you're touching on an x and y axis is then showed um, by lighting up certain squares on a screen. 
So I put the link uh, to the, the blog where there's like a lot of different other interactions that you can do with textile, so you can check that afterwards. But ultimately, that's kind of what I would like to be building because it's also um, like it's super lightweight and it's uh, like on your skin, so you could really just interact with interfaces with that. So that's really cool. A, different, a few different applications. Oh, this is where I wish the videos were working, but um, okay. So uh, accessories. So as I, one of my prototypes that I built was to augment a couch, but you, you have some brands uh, that are, are, are already working on accessories that are uh, augmented with interactive textile. This brand has a pair of speakers and instead of having buttons, it's a uh, textile that you can press a certain way to uh, trigger a next song, put the volume up or down and things like that. Uh, you can make musical instruments. So. <sighs> I really like this video. Is it really not going to work? Because this one, yeah, okay. Um, so I don't know if you heard of the Mimu Gloves. Uh, I think it's a project that started about uh, seven or eight years ago uh, by an artist called Imogen Heap. And she also has a team of engineers that have been building these musical gloves. So uh, on top of having conductive thread, it's also gloves that are embedded with flex sensors and position sensors. So if you are interested, I really, uh, I really advise you to actually watch that video after, it's really, really cool. So by just being on stage and moving hands a certain way, you can change the frequency or the beat or the instrument. And, um, and that's like a total new way of, having, um, of playing music, of having gigs. Uh, accessibility, so this project is, uh, it has the same concept where a pair of gloves is embedded with uh, flex sensors. And uh, it's a, just a team of students who have been working on training a machine learning model to recognize to be able to map uh, sign language to actual spoken words. So this is a prototype, but it's something that you could do as well as JavaScript developers. Um, and hopefully you feel like, you know, that hopefully it makes a bit more sense now that I explained to you how it works. And finally, and I realized that a few, just a couple of days ago, you can store data into textile, like what? Um, so the way this one works, and I wish I really wanted to get it to work for today, but I didn't have the time. Uh, it's like if you magnetized uh, conductive thread, you could actually encode uh, bits into it and you can just like send messages. So this particular demo is actually around gesture recognition with just uh, magnetized thread. So it's not in the camera, it's using the magnetometer in your phone. And when uh, it senses the change in magnetic field, you could actually have encode, like build different types of gestures just by having a little piece of magnetized conductive thread on your finger. And that works through uh, your clothes. So it means that you could actually have your phone in your pocket and just by uh, doing it, putting your hand a bit closer, just trigger things. And if you have a piece of thread on all of your fingers, you could really map certain gestures quite, uh, quite nicely. And, uh, and it's really cool that you don't have you don't have to have a PhD to do things like this. Like I was, uh, I'm quite convinced that I could figure out how to do this. It's going to take me probably a bit more time, but I was Googling yesterday, like how to calculate the magnitude of magnetic fields. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it's so cool. Uh, I didn't figure it out yet. I need to find the formula, but um, you have a web, uh, you have the sensor API in the browser that allows you to have access to stuff from the magnetometer in your phone. Uh, it just doesn't, <clears throat> it just doesn't give you the magnitude. So you have to calculate it yourself. So uh, maybe I will come back one day and I would have figured it out. But uh, of course, you know, I've been talking about the possibilities and how excited I am about this, but there are limits. So I have to mention that as well. Um, it is partially waterproof. We're talking about textile. So obviously, you know, if you wear something on a jacket and it rains, you have to be a bit careful, uh, but you, uh, you can add a certain coating. So there's a spray that you can add on conductive thread to make it waterproof. Uh, conductive thread works for two years maximum. So I think it works like well for two years and then like, not that it doesn't work anymore uh, all of a sudden, but it means that the reading might change uh, over time. And finally, quite interestingly, the capacitance changes with external factors, and that will impact the way that you're going to code, that will impact the threshold. What it, what it means is that depending on the weather, if it's humid or dry, the reading that you're going to get, uh, the capacitance is going to be different. So your threshold, uh, you know, mine was a thousand, but if it was like a dry winter day, it might have been different. So depending on what you actually want to build, if it's a jacket that goes outside, you'll have to take that into consideration. If you have like a couch at home, well, you will be less affected by external factors, so it should be all right. Uh, but yeah, so that's to me, that's the main uh, limits that I found. Also, if you want to do this, I would not advise to do it by hand because sometimes it takes hours to just put stuff together. And that was very frustrating for me. Um, and a few extras. So 
I made most of my experiments with conductive thread, but it's not the only uh, material that you can use. So there's actually quite a lot. You can use conductive rubber stretch sensor, so you can uh, detect how the rubber is conductive, but also how much you stretch it, so that's pretty cool. I don't know what I would do with it, but I'm like, ooh, that's nice. Uh, the second one is a piece of conductive fabric. So instead of just having uh, the thread you could actually cover a bigger area of textile by cutting fabric into different uh, shapes or, or just cover or have an entire shirt that's conductive instead of just a uh, you know, piece of it. Uh, you have pressure sensitive conductive sheet where uh, instead of just having the conductivity, you could have the pressure, how much you're pressing on the sheet as well. And then finally, you have stretch resistive fabric where you can read the amount of stretch by, um, by stretching it. Uh, and the, what that would allow you to do as well is to play with something that I really want to do that's called uh, electrical to topography, where instead of just... So it's about finding coordinates as well. But for me, to find coordinates and map them to a screen, I made a grid of thread and I converted that into coordinates. But if you have a, a sheet of fabric, there is actually a way to try and find approximately where you're touching it by doing electrical topography. So you're adding sensors all around the sheet and they're going to give you a certain value of capacitance and as your body touches the conductive sheet it's going to um, well, it's going to change the electric charge and by reading the data coming in all sensors you can approximately know uh, how close you are to certain sen sensors rather than others and uh, what i really like about that is that it's not something that i thought JavaScript devs would be able to do, like usually you just build websites. But now I know that by just tinkering with a bit of hardware, you can actually uh, come up, you, you, there's, probably, there's, there's probably a formula to actually calculate this. I just need to buy the sensors and then uh, figure stuff out and, and just play with stuff like this, um, which I think is really cool. And then finally, before I finish, some final words of wisdom that are not by me, but they're by Einstein. Uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. Uh, for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. And uh, I read this quote while I was reading a really short essay called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Uh, and what I really like, you don't have to believe me when I say that this is really uh, interesting and important to look into this, but if Einstein says that it's important, then you know, you kind of have to believe it. Um, but the reason why I'm saying that is because I feel like sometimes as developers, we're not really uh, using our full potential in what we can build. Uh, I think we might, we might forget that a lot of people who are not devs have to just take the world as it is and just buy the stuff that other people have built without really having the chance to make it more personal or you can imagine but you can't build. Whereas as developers, even just JavaScript developers, it doesn't, you don't need to, to like have like a master's degree or know all the languages in the world. It's just about being curious and want to not only imagine what you could do with tech, but you also get to build it. And I feel like that's, uh, that's extremely powerful. We don't know what kind of interactions are going to be in the future, but we can actually get to tinker and maybe even, you know, get to influence how it's going to be. And uh, that's like one of my favorite part of tech. If tech was only about building React components at work, I might not want to be there. I mean, it's, it's cool too, but I, the fact that you can use technology to build a lot more and whatever comes to mind uh, is, is really, really cool to me. Uh, so that's all I had today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, the organizers, for helping, for helping me set up. That was a bit, uh, that was a bit uh, yeah, of a hassle. But thank you, everybody, for staying with me for half an hour. And if you have any questions about that, or if you have any uh, ideas of stuff that you want to build, if you just want to talk about that, uh, I will be around for the next two days. And otherwise, I will be sharing uh, the slides on Twitter. There's a lot more resources, and the videos will work uh, better than they did here, because they didn't. But um, anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. That was it.